All right. Um, I want to say good day to all of you that have joined us virtually for this Polar Connect event on April 27, 2017. Again, this is our second event with Jennifer um, Baldacci and Dr. Corey Williams, who is not with us at the moment. We're oh, focusing on Arctic ground. Oh, good. He'll be coming. Oh, there he is. Good morning, Dr. Williams. Good morning. Um, we're going, to, we're going to be looking at Arctic ground squirrels and what they're doing up at Tulick Field Station in Alaska. Um, I'm your host today, Janet Warburton. I work with the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. Um, I'm working with Judy Fonstock. We both work for Arcus, and we'll be um, running this um, webinar for you today. A few things about the platform that we're working with. It's called Adobe Connect, and as you can see, hopefully the slides are changing in the, for you, and you see a new slide called Getting to Know Adobe Connect. There's a chat area where you can um, type in who you are, the number of students or adults that are with you, and kind of give us an idea of where you're coming from. This is also where you can post your questions as we go along, and you can see there's a list of participants. Um, on the far uh, left, as well as a webcam this morning. Um, we'll see how the webcam goes. Um, it seems that Tulik is having a little bit better internet this morning than it was the other night, so we'll be able to um, hopefully see Corey and Jen the entire presentation. We will not be able to see you all today. This will just be a one-way stream of the pre presenters, so we won't get to see all of the classrooms today. Um, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself virtually in the chat area by typing in who you are and the number of adults and where you're joining us from. A little bit about the program and why Jennifer is up at Tulick Field Station. She's part of a National Science Foundation funded program called the Polar Trek program, teachers and researchers exploring and collaborating. And we've been um, placing teachers like Jen, with researchers like Dr. Williams for over 10 years in the polar regions. Um, it's a U.S.-based program, and it's an opportunity for teachers to learn um, and get hands-on science and then take that back into the classrooms um, to become better at teaching science and enhance their, um, what they're teaching. So we're really excited about Polar Trek, and um, we love these connections, and we love hearing about all the science. For questions today, uh, again, please start off by posting them in the chat area. We'll interrupt as we can along the way. Dr. Williams is there as well, so he might be able to type a few answers as we go along. And we'll recap questions at the end for sure and ask um, um, if anybody wants to ask them live as well. We'll remind you how to do that. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Jen, and if you... Um, have questions again, please type them in the area in the chat area and we'll interrupt as we go along. All right, Jen, it's your turn. All right. Um, thanks, Janet. Um, so uh, Dr. Williams are and we don't hear you, today. Jen. Oh, you can't you're hear muted. me now? Somehow you're there you go. Uh, okay, that's nope. all right. No. All right, let's <laughs> see. Nope, you hear my dog barking, but you don't hear you. <laughs> Dr. Williams, you need to go back to bed. So, oh. oh, now we hear you. It, it, you can hear us now? Is it OK? Mm, yeah, why don't you talk now? OK, can you hear me now? <laughs> I feel like a cell phone commercial. <laughs> yes. We can hear you now. Go ahead. OK, great. Um, so I guess before we get started, I just want to say my other niece, Jessica, is on, and I want to say hello to her and her class, and I'm so glad you guys could join us. Um, this is Corey Williams. He is the researcher that I'm working with here at Tulick Field Station. Good morning, Corey. Good morning. <laughs> um, he got his coffee, and he's ready to go. So let's see. Um, I'm trying to remember how to... Here we go. Um, the first slide actually introduces Corey, so I'm going to let him do that for you because it feels more more real. 
Okay, so I'm a research faculty at Northern Arizona University, and I also work at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I conduct research in a whole variety of environments, uh, but a big part of my program is up here in the Arctic, um, studying ground squirrels and trying to understand how animals uh, are adapted to these really extreme environments and particularly to understand um, how they're responding to uh, long-term climate change. And so uh, the Arctic ground squirrel research is really focused on understanding timing in these animals. How do they know when to end hibernation and begin their active season? And how are they going, or how much capacity do they have to adjust their timing? So how much of this is sort of a, an instinctive uh, event for them versus how much are they responding to the environment to determine when they're active. And so these guys are sort of uh, incredible hibernators. Um, the uh, temperatures drop as low as minus 26 Celsius in their burrows and they're hibernating for uh, up to nine months of the year. And they only have a very short window of about three months during which they need to reproduce. And so timing is really critical in this kind of an environment. And uh, you'll also see a picture of uh, me with a skunk there. Uh, that's from some other work I've been doing in uh, northern Arizona. And there we're studying skunks in a suburban environment and uh, trying to understand how these animals uh, make use of uh, habitat provided by humans. I'd also like to mention that it is currently a minus 26 outside. Celsius. <laughs> um, so it's exactly as cold outside as it is inside of a burrow um, in the dead of winter, which is, for those of you who live in Fahrenheit, which is most of you, it's negative 15 degrees. So it's actually quite cold out now, and it's colder than it has been um, most of the time that we've been here. So it's interesting to see it kind of reverse back a little bit. Um, I know that just happened in Basel uh, when I talked to them two days ago. It was also um, snowing, which it had been quite spring when I left, so um, interesting. So yeah, that's a, an important point is that this Arctic environment is extremely variable, um, you know, from one week to the next and from one year to the next. And so uh, a lot of us up here are really interested in how animals are able to um, survive in these kind of uh, variable environments. So it's not just extreme, but it's also extremely variable. All right, um, I realized on my last presentation uh, that I did for Basel, I forgot to kind of explain where I am. So I've just got a little thing here to show you kind of where I live and where I, how I got here. Um, so I live about an hour away from Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I'm an American teacher working at an international school. Um, I used to work in Wellington in Florida, and now I'm at the International School of Basel. Um, I couldn't get this picture to draw exactly the right path, but I did fly from Zurich to Chicago, where I stopped in to visit my um, grandmother while I was there, and my mom came up, and my family was there. Um, and then I flew from Chicago to Fairbanks, Alaska, via Seattle. So I had one flight to Seattle and another flight to Fairbanks, which is a much longer um, journey than you might expect for being in the same country. Um, it took several hours. I, I can't remember now, maybe five, six hours to get to Seattle, and then another three and a half to get to Fairbanks. Um, and then from Fairbanks, um, I met Corey there, and we drove up to Tulick Field Station. So you can see this is a map of um, Alaska. And about halfway up Alaska, you can see Fairbanks. And then we drove along the um, oil pipeline road, the Dalton Highway, most of the way, not directly from Fairbanks, I guess. And then um, we ended up at Tulick Field Station, which is where we are now. So it's, it's not quite in the very north of Alaska at the coast, but it is quite far north, and it's north of the Brooks Range, the mountains that we have nearby here. And we are uh, well north of the Arctic Circle. So we're officially in the Arctic um, and in a polar zone. So I made this slide 
which is kind of something that uh, Corey's already addressed. So basically why he's doing the work that he's doing here and this particular project um, is, I, I've just highlighted a couple words that I thought were um, the most uh, important or descriptive of here. So it's a long-term study. And so the part that I'm doing, he's got a couple projects going on in his, through his lab, um, but this one is a long-term study to look at these squirrels and how they are reacting, as he said, to um, from hibernation, when to wake up, um, how they're reacting to climate change and the impacts of that and how it will affect them. So I just wanted to reinforce that idea here. Um, a little bit of information about the squirrels. So they are hibernators, we talked about, but they hibernate for an extensive period of time, which I still find fascinating, seven to nine months of the year, um, about seven months on, on average, I guess, for the males and up to nine months for the females. Um, the males wake up, they get up from hibernation about a month before the females or so, um, and they start eating food that they've cached in their burrows and they put on weight um, so that they can come out of their burrows as soon as possible and start looking for mates as the females are um, coming out of hibernation. Um, they tend to breed quite, quite quickly after that. Um, and within a month's time, the female will have between five and 10 uh, pups in her litter that she's raising. And then before hibernation again, which already happens in August, those pups are on their own and living in their own burrows and taking care of themselves. So it's all, it's all very fast. Um, even the time of year, if you think they only have between three and five months of the year maximum above ground and awake, it all goes by really quickly. Um, do you want to add to that at all or do you think? Uh, no, I think that about covers it. So it's uh, th these females come out of hibernation and uh, within just a couple of days are impregnated. And uh, they're trying to reproduce as early as possible um, so that they can give as much time for their juveniles to grow and fatten prior to that first hibernation. Because it's really important for those juveniles to have as long as possible if they're going to survive that first winter of hibernation. Um, that reminds me, um, I think it was, well, one of the, one of the teachers who sent me questions, um, there was a question about the, the squirrels. Would they make good pets? <laughs> and are they aggressive? Um, they would not make good pets. <laughs> Pretty much, I think that's true for any wild animal. Um, definitely not a, a pet type of situation. They are adorable, um, but they're much better off on their own. But they're not particularly aggressive, no. I mean, they, they are not aggressive animals. They're prey species, and they're looking to um, they're looking to come above ground, feed, be as safe as possible, and then get back in their burrows. Um, even when we capture them in the traps, they just would like to get away. They don't want to fight us, for example. Um, but not good pets. Uh, also, I see a question here about... Yeah, kind of... Sorry, Janet. Yeah, I was just going to interrupt you that there were some uh, additional questions before you move on to the field study about how much do they normally weigh, how long do they live, and then um, I think you'll probably go into hibernation, so we can wait on that one. Okay. So they, uh, the males can weigh up to a kilo, which is 2.2 pounds. Um, and uh, the females uh, in spring weigh about half that, um, but they'll be, so they'll be about um, a pound in spring and then uh, a pound and a half by the time they enter hibernation. So they put on a huge amount of fat immediately before they enter hibernation. And so this, this nine months of hibernation, the females don't feed at all. And so they're just surviving entirely off of their fat stores. And of course, they're really reducing uh, their uh, metabolism. Uh, and they're um, doing this by suppressing metabolism and cooling their body temperature. So their body temperatures will get incredibly low um, down to uh, just below uh, the freezing point of water. Um, and that's a, a huge energetic savings for the animals, but they're still have to warm themselves periodically throughout hibernation, and that requires a lot of energy, and so they're doing that entirely using their fat stores. Uh, in terms of how long um, they live, uh, the males typically only live to about three years of age, and this is uh, because they fight a lot. And uh, so um, in spring, when the males come out before the females are up, they establish territories. 
and um, they, they defend those territorial boundaries. Uh, but when the females start to emerge, then the males start to uh, fight a lot. Um, uh, and so it's really uh, about um, trying to outcompete those other males for access to females. So sometimes in spring, we see a lot of uh, wounding uh, in the males, um, and we'll bring them in and they'll have you know, huge torn uh, up parts of their body. We haven't seen that this spring, uh, but some years it's really bad. Um, and there was another question about, um, oh, what is their routine before they hibernate? So the, the females um, wean their pups. So um, uh, they stop producing milk in late July, and then um, they go through a, a molt. So they're um, uh, changing their fur coat. Their fur color changes a little bit, and it gets denser immediately <clears throat> before hibernation. And then they're putting on a ton of fat during that period. So they're just foraging a lot. Uh, but they're still with their juveniles during that interval. And so um, a lot of you are familiar with um, ground squirrels and other areas and those chirping noises they make. And those are alarm calls. And so the females will make alarm calls that warn all the, the young to come back into their burrow um, when there's a predator around. So even though they're uh, no longer lactating, uh, they're still really important uh, to the survival of their young. Now the males, it's, it's quite different. So the females go into hibernation in early August when there's still lots of food on the ground. The males um, stay up and they stay up through September and usually are, are entering hibernation in October. And this is because these males um, are not only fattening, but they're also storing a lot of food um, prior to hibernation. And they don't feed on that food cache during hibernation, but what happens in spring is they end hibernation and then they stay below ground for a month and feed on that food cache. And so this allows them to um, do a couple things. One is they put on all this protein and fat that they lost during hibernation. So when they emerge to the surface, they're physically strong and able to compete with other males. Uh, the other thing it allows them to do is undergo puberty because these animals go through puberty each year. And so a big part of our current project is trying to understand um, what controls that puberty in males during hibernation. So Corey, does, is that because they have to, so they have to regrow their testes in the spring? Is that the idea? Right. So they, they uh, regrow their their testes, they undergo spermatogenesis, and so by the time the males actually come out of their burrows, um, they're able to fight other males but also uh, reproduce. All right. Um, I saw a question, are they related to the groundhog? I have learned that they are. <laughs> they are all marmots. <laughs> they're in the tribe marmotini, <laughs> which is a classification, um, but they are types of ground squirrels, all of them, and they're related to even chipmunks I learned last night. <laughs> right, so you have um, a lot of um, uh, marmots are the, uh, are the bigger looking um, ground squirrels, um, and so woodchucks are an example of a marmot as well. Uh, but they're the, the one species of marmot that's solitary. Most marmots um, live in family groups, whereas the ground squirrels are different. Um, they don't live in these family groups. They're sort of mm -hmm. always as uh, individuals, except during that interval where um, females are caring for the young. Um, and so the, the tribe marmotini includes these larger marmots. It includes the ground squirrels. Uh, it also includes um, prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. And I see that there's a question to say, has there ever been a female that we know of giving birth during hibernation? I'm going to guess no, because the breeding would happen before hibernation and the birth. But do you know of any? Yeah, so that does not happen in the ground squirrels. They always um, go through pregnancy and um, give birth um, after hibernation. Uh, there are some species that will still um, drop into torpor, that, that really low body temperature and uh, reduced metabolism state um, while they're pregnant, but but not the ground squirrel. So that will happen in um, some of the bats, uh, mm -hmm. as well as a, a lot of the marsupials, actually. And then uh, bears, of course, will uh, give birth during that um, hibernation interval. So they're quite different. Mm -hmm. OK. So let's Great on. questions. All right. We'll let you carry on there, Jen. They are. Um, 
So I just wanted to show you here the field sites. We're working at two different sites, um, both in the area. So the site that we spent the most time at so far is East Attigan, which is about uh, 12 miles from Tulik Field Station where we're based. Um, we drive there by truck, or sometimes we have a truck problem and we get dropped off by truck. That only happened one time. Um, and then we just have to hike into our site. It's not that long of a hike though. It, it's quite, uh, quite easy. Um, and then this area seems to be more heavily populated by squirrels, um, definitely at this time of year. And that's at, at any time of year, is that right? Yeah, so yeah. around uh, Attigan River, uh, because of the river, there's a lot of sandy soil. Mm -hmm. And so that makes really good soil for uh, burrowing. And so um, the soil around Tulip Lake is much rockier. And so there's only uh, specific areas where you'll see burrows. So the density is much higher around Attigan River. Interestingly enough, I've never seen the river or the lake, even though I have walked on the river and driven a snow machine across the lake. Um, everything is under a lot of ice right now, although the, the river is starting to um, almost appear like a river. So it's got some water melt on it and uh, I have seen a picture of it flowing, <laughs> which is very exciting. Um, and in this picture, I don't know if you can see them, but the on the picture for Tulik Lake, there are ptarmigan which are birds that live here. And they are, in the winter, they are white. They, they are out all winter, um, which amazes me because it gets quite cold. But they are white to blend into their surroundings. But then as the snow will melt off, they will um, go through. Is it also called molting for birds? The, yes, they, it's a molt. Yeah, I yeah. thought so. OK, so they go through a molt, and they um, will have their brown feathers, which then blend in with the tundra. So they're not as obviously um, dinner. If possible. Yeah, so a couple weeks from now, these, these uh, ptarmigan will start molting, and a lot of them will, will turn all brown, and they'll just have white heads for a while, and then later in the summer, they'll be completely brown. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, it's funny to see the ground squirrels right now walking around, because sometimes you can see them, like in that picture on the left, on the tundra, and sometimes you can see them on the snow. And they really stick out. They're really obvious on the snow, but most of the time that there's snow, they're hibernating, so they're, they don't need to change their coat. But on the tundra, it's very hard to see them. They're, they blend in very well. So I see there's a question about uh, predators. Um, for uh, both ptarmigan and uh, ground squirrels, um, foxes are an important uh, predator. Uh, wolves will uh, prey on the ground squirrels as well. Uh, and then there are a lot of um, uh, raptors. So uh, in particular, the areas we work in, there are golden eagles uh, that will feed on them. And uh, if you go further north, uh, snowy owls. And um, around here, we have um, later in the summer, um, some uh, short-eared owls uh, will move in, and they'll also prey on them. And then uh, some of the juveniles will also be uh, preyed on by um, the ravens. Mm -hmm. There's a nesting pair of ravens right at the pipeline when we walk in to East Addigan. Okay, so um, this slide kind of focuses on the stuff that we bring with us. Not all of it's in the picture, but most of it um, that we bring into the field with us when we go. So when we hike into Attigan, we don't bring a lot of stuff with us, um, but we definitely do have these little packs that we wear on our waist, um, little fanny packs, and um, as well as there are traps. So the traps that we catch the squirrels in are already at the field site. We brought them in on the first day, which was hilarious because we had them on a sled to just bring easily behind us, but it was very windy that day and the sled kept tipping over. Um, but it was entertaining, so it was good. Um, and then every day when we go around setting traps, we bring carrots, which are apparently the most delicious food you could possibly ever come across as a ground squirrel. They love them. Um, we have our knives to cut the carrots. Um, we have tape so when we do um, find a squirrel in a trap we can mark the trap to say where we found that squirrel and what time of day and which day it was um, just so we have everything recorded for when we come back to the lab um, and then also that's for the next day when we bring the squirrels back we can release them back at their same burrow so we don't just bring them anywhere we bring them home um, we also bring plastic tubes which you can see next to the carrot there's a tiny um, tube there that we collect poop samples in, so fecal samples. Um, we have a map of the field site so we can note down where we caught which squirrel, or uh, not, I'm sorry, not which squirrel, but where we um, 
set the traps initially. So when we're walking around, we can set the traps. We note down we have two traps at this site, um, five traps at this site. All of the burrows are numbered with a, a stake in the ground. And this way, we can not forget that we set any of the traps. So we know exactly how many traps are where. Um, we also keep stacks of empty traps in different places so we can locate those again easily. Um, for locating them easily, we also use flagging tape, which is um, on that knife, you can see the pink tape. For example, if I drop my knife in the snow, it is a white knife, it will not be obvious, but it has a piece of pink flagging tape on it, which makes it more easily identifiable. Um, and the traps all have that as well, so that we can, when we get close, we can easily see them. Um, sometimes we bring walkie-talkies with us, so that if we're in different parts of the site, we don't have to shout at each other. Um, and then we also bring a list of all the animals that we've already caught on this trip because once we bring them back to the lab and release them to the field, we don't need to bring them back again. Um, so if we catch them again, we can release them just there. We don't have to bring them back again. So uh, a couple more questions have come up. Uh, one is about their population size and whether they're endangered. Uh, their population size is huge but really kind of unknown uh, because their distribution is so wide. <laughs> So they occur throughout Alaska, uh, throughout northern Canada, and all the way across in um, Siberia. So uh, originally, they, uh, ground squirrels crossed uh, the, the Arctic land bridge, moved into North America, and Arctic ground squirrels actually crossed back into uh, Siberia. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have this really wide uh, geographic range. Uh, and they occur um, not just up in the Arctic, but they're all, all the way down in the boreal forest. So uh, a lot of them in northern Canada and um, some of the lower parts of Alaska will be in the boreal forest and in um, uh, uh, at higher altitudes uh, in particular. Uh, the other question was, uh, why do we collect poop samples? So uh, we can actually measure hormones in the poop samples. And so uh, this is one of the things we're doing to try and understand how these animals uh, respond to this environmental variability. So we can look at things like stress hormones and how uh, uh, whether they increase their secretion of uh, stress hormones under environmentally challenging conditions and if they're using these stress hormones to modulate their, their responses to environmental change. And so across a, a wide uh, variety of animals, uh, stress hormones play a really important role in um, sort of responses to variable environments. And so we're trying to understand how ground squirrels uh, use uh, these hormones, as well as uh, thyroid hormones. All right. So uh, when, we, when we do uh, trap the squirrels and bring them back, so if we're at East Adigan, we have to drive back here those uh, 12 miles. So we keep them overnight. Um, if we're trapping here at Tulik, which we've only done a couple times so far, um, we can release them the same day. But I wanted to show you the data loggers that we're using with the animals. So if you see at the very bottom left, the pit tags, um, all the animals that we're catching right now, all of the ground squirrels are getting pit tags. Um, it's the same kind of identification that you would use for your pets, so your cats or your dog. Um, the vet might put in a chip that would identify them with a, a little reader. So if the dog got lost and found again, they would know that it was your dog. Um, the ground squirrels are also getting these kind of um, pit tags for identification, as well as ear tags. So um, in another picture, you may see we give them little ear tags here. So each ear gets a number. It's a little silver tag with a number. And it also gets um, each of those silver tags has a little piece of wire um, on it, which has a color on it. So we can identify them by their ear tag colors and numbers as well. So that would be easily identifiable. Um, but if those tags go missing, for example, um, they still have the pit tag that we can read it with. Um, and then also right now, especially for the females, um, we are putting on ideally all three of the other types of loggers as well. So you can see in that big picture in the middle, there's a picture of a squirrel collar, um, which is a flat zip tie um, within plastic tubing. So um, Corey measures it out. So he has to put the collar, it's like a little necklace for the squirrel. It's a lot of bling, um, very pretty. And he has to measure it out so that it fits around the squirrel's neck comfortably, but not too loose to fall off. 
So um, he wants to allow her, for example, to fatten up, get ready for hibernation so that it's not tight, but also so that it doesn't fit over her head um, so that she can lose the collar. Um, because on the collar, there's going to be these two different types of loggers. So on the left is the light and temperature logger, so the outdoor temperature logger. Um, and this device is, well, it's measuring each of those things, but specifically for the light, it can determine whether the squirrel is underground or above ground at the time. Um, it's important because in the Arctic, in the summer, it doesn't get dark. Even here in the spring, um, it, it doesn't get fully dark at night anymore, I would say. Anytime I look out of my window, there's still, it looks like the very beginning of dawn um, in the night. You can just see red on the horizon. So it's never fully dark, but when the squirrels go underground in their burrows, it is dark. So this um, device can measure the amount of light and it can tell um, Corey if the squirrel is above ground or below ground. Um, and next to that is the accelerometer. Um, and this piece of equipment is measuring movement in the animal. So he can measure um, how the animal is moving, how fast it's moving, kind of uh, directionally, which uh, direction that that squirrel is moving in. Um, do you want to speak more about that? Yeah, so, so we use the accelerometers really as a metric of energy expenditure. So um, because as you move, um, you're um, burning more energy. And so you can think about this as being very analogous to the Fitbits that people wear on their wrists. And so that they're counting your steps throughout the day and people are interested in this, you know, to see how much exercise they're getting and how much um, energy they're burning. And so we use this in the ground squirrels to see how that um, environmental change in different um, parts of the season uh, affect their energy expenditure. Um, I see that um, Ms. Harris's class wants to know where they put the, where we put the pit tags on the body. Um, it goes um, just at the back of the neck, basically um, between the shoulder blades. <clears throat> and then, yeah, squirrel Fitbit. Yeah, it's it basically it's exactly the same thing. I was reading about accelerometers and they're in your phones, they're in your Fitbits. So this is what is um, measuring these things. So it's just a different version of that. Um, and then the final piece of equipment that we use are these body temperature loggers. Um, so these are actually measuring, unlike the light and outdoor temperature, they're measuring the temperature inside the body. Um, the picture of this one is because it's in a sterile condition still, it's in its packaging, which is why you see that halo around it. Um, but it measures the temperature of the squirrel, so they can look at um, the body temperature during activity or during hibernation, for example. Um, and using these guys, they figured out that their body temperature can go below freezing um, in the winter during hibernation, which I think is very cool. Um, I would picture a squirrel popsicle, but Corey assures me that that is not the case. Um, it's great. It's, it's really interesting what it can measure here. So um, that device is implanted in the squirrel um, and that goes... Um, yeah, through a small incision in the abdominal cavity and then we can put that in, put a couple sutures in and then, um, yeah, and then they're off with it. And these particular devices, um, we have a, a specialized antenna uh, actually, you can see it right here, and if I get it in front of the camera, that's like a little circle, and so we can insert the squirrel into this antenna and then download the loggers through the body cavity. Yeah, it's actually really cool. Um, and the other, the other devices on the collar, the collar has to be retrieved, and then they can um, download it. So you can see on that light logger again on the left, you can actually see the two little pins that stick out. Um, you can just connect those into a circuit, and the computer reads the information and downloads it, and you can redeploy it. Um, the other one is not so, they have to remove the epoxy on the outside, and then they can read it, and then um, possibly redeploy that also. So there's been a couple questions about uh, how many animals have we tagged? Uh, that's a great question, which I actually knew the answer to it. Um, this project's been going on um, in terms of the, the long-term aspect of it uh, since the uh, mid nineties. And so uh, we're tagging typically about 50 plus animals a year. Um, so we're into the thousands at this point. Um, and a lot of those tags, um, you know, the pit tags and the ear tags, we'll never see again because um, uh, juveniles um, are a really important food source for a lot of the animals in this area. So the foxes and the raptors and the owls and so on. And so uh, 
you know, the, the number of juveniles that survived th through that first summer and into the first winter is very low um, because they're, you know, an important element in the food chain. Um, was there another question? Um, one question is asking about how do they see in the burrows if it's dark in there? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> another great question. Yeah. Um, I think they don't see very well in those burrows at all. So our light loggers indicate that there's very little light um, once they're in there. Uh, but these animals actually have a really good um, sense of smell. And um, you know this from things like having forgotten my lunch inside my jacket pocket and leaving that near my backpack and squirrels will come and chew through your jacket into your uh, lunch. And so I think um, to get around in the burrows, they're using their sense of smell a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then did we, I think we addressed the question, are all the tags still working or, to some degree? Yeah, so um, a, a lot of these tags have a, a limited uh, battery life. And so um, the ones that we have on collars, we can, um, we just pull that collar off and can put a new collar on um, so that the light logger tags last a couple of years. Um, the accelerometers only last a couple months, um, but they're rechargeable. So um, we are continually pulling tags off and redeploying tags on these animals. All right. And Judy asks, <laughs> do we pack carrots? In our lunches? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, the food here is too good to only pet carrots, but I can tell you that when we're cutting carrots in the field, it leaves my hands kind of stained orange and smelling delicious, which I still find upsetting. Like, I don't know if I'm turning squirrely or what, but um, I didn't know carrots were so sweet and they smell like dessert. So I think that's weird. <laughs> All right, let's see um, how to trap a squirrel. So. This slide is a little bit obvious. See the squirrel, walk to the squirrel. Um, but I wanted to point out that we're not just, just leaving traps all over the wild. Um, so we are really targeting to catch as many squirrels as possible that are living in this area. So we actually visually sight the animal first, and then we either uh, walk over to it and it goes in a burrow, and then we can leave the traps. Or it turns out they run across the entire tundra <laughs> and Corey goes running after them. <laughs> not really, but sort of. Um, so we do try to to get all of the individuals that we can so that they can collect as much information as possible. Um, and basically, it just involves putting one of those traps down, um, putting a little nice trail of carrots into the trap, some uh, nice carrot at the back of the trap, and then ideally the um, animal walking in and getting trapped. Um, I have a nice video that I haven't been able to do anything with yet, but it, it only took six minutes from the time I set up the trap in the GoPro and walked away until the animal had eaten all the carrot, gotten in the trap, and gotten trapped. And everything is perfectly on, on the camera. So that's the first time that's happened for me. So there's a, a question of uh, do we catch uh, squirrels that we've already tagged? And uh, the answer to that is uh, definitely yes. And uh, there's actually a lot of personality in individual squirrels. So some squirrels um, really like carrot and are not fearful of the traps at all. And so you can set a trap and they'll almost immediately go in it. Uh, so others are a lot more apprehensive at first. And then we have some squirrels that uh, learn you know, what the traps are and try and steal carrots in any way without actually getting into the trap. So uh, it, it does take more effort to catch certain squirrels. And, and some squirrels, um, like the one we'll show you uh, later, uh, we'll hop into a trap in a second because they just love carrot and they don't mind being trapped so much. Yeah, and this squirrel that we'll show you later, we've caught him several times. We catch him all the time. We catch him every day. Um, we caught him the other day twice. So that's why we brought him back and we thought, okay, you're the good squirrel to show. Um, he definitely loves the traps. Um, uh, is one sex harder to catch than the other? Yes, but it depends on the time of year. So uh, for instance, in um, uh, when the females are lactating, um, they are uh, really searching for as much energy as possible and they become easier to trap. Uh, but as they go from sort of that lactating to weaning phase, for whatever reason, they, they become really difficult to catch. Uh, we think this might be just they become more weary of traps when they are um, caring for their young that are now, instead of being down in a burrow, they've moved up to the surface. And so the females don't seem to be trapped as easily at that time of year. Uh, again, for the males, um, they can be trapped pretty easily 
immediately after um, they've ended hibernation. Um, but sometimes once the females start to come up, they become more difficult to trap um, because they're more interested in uh, reproducing than they are in uh, feeding on carrot. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Um, in this slide, I've just got a little bit of information. It looks like a lot of words and you don't have to read all the words, but um, the idea here is I wanted to kind of walk you through the process of all the things and all the types of data that we collect on the squirrels. So what kind of information are we gathering? Um, so once we get the squirrel to a position where we can process them or to collect the data from them, which means either for us right now at this time of year, bringing the squirrels, pretty much it's bringing the squirrels back to the lab. In the summer, um, they can do this information right at the field site. But for us, we bring the, the animals back to the lab, and then um, we have to anesthetize them so that they are sleeping and not stressed out while we're working with them. So it makes it um, safer for everybody and also less stress for the animal. And you can see that picture in the top right. So um, we put this jar next to the trap, and then um, the animal goes into the jar. We can give it some gas. <laughs> not quite laughing gas, but it, it, it uh, helps them sleep and relax. Yeah, so it's, it, the, the drug we use is called isofluorine, and we have a, a vaporizer, so we can really control the amount uh, of the drug that we're giving them. Very similar to what an anesthesiologist would give to, to a, a person. So when they put that mask on you um, to knock you out, we just put them in a jar, and, and we cover the jar with... Um, uh, a black towel. A black towel, and so it's a dark environment, and so they feel safe in there, and then they they uh, are knocked out, and then we can um, work with them. Yeah, and then once we take them out of the jar, we actually put a little mask on them. <laughs> Corey made a little mask out of cardboard, and it's adorable, and it fits right over their faces, so um, it's quite comfortable for them. In the next picture down, you can see um, a pit tag reader. So again, this is uh, the one above that. Yeah, you can see a pit tag reader. So the squirrel is just under the reader and we just hold it up and it can read their shoulder blades remember where the pit tags go um, and if they have a pit tag we can identify them this way if they don't have one we know that we need to give them one um, in the next picture down uh, we're measuring the zygomatic arch <laughs> so across the the head the widest point um, this is just another piece of data like we collect the weight as well we collect this information and the body length yeah, so, so we're collecting different measures of the, the size of the squirrel, so like the zygomatic arch, uh, as well as the body length, and then we compare that to their mass. So we want to know how fat a squirrel is relative to their body size, and so this is a, a nice, easy way to get that. The only squirrel we've caught so far at Tulik right here um, has had the widest head we've seen out yeah. of any squirrel this year. But. So uh, we work at, at these two sites, um, and they're only 20 kilometers apart, uh, but the squirrels um, at Tulik Lake are actually substantially larger uh, than the squirrels at Attigan River in most years. Um, so the males uh, will be about 20% larger. Um, and we, we don't really know why that is. Um, it could be related to food or the lower density, um, but we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we also, so we give them the pit tags if they need them. We also give them ear tags if, if they don't have them, the colors and the numbers. Um, we cheek swab them, kind of the same thing, like um, like a CSI for DNA, so it's very exciting. Um, we also collect a little piece of uh, tissue sample from the ear. Uh, it's really so tiny, it's almost hard to see it. Um, but this way, it's another measure where they can take DNA from. Uh, we collect fleas or any parasites if they have them. We've had them only on a couple of squirrels so far this year, um, maybe three squirrels or so, not so many. Um, we give them, oh, and we collect a blood sample as well, which you can see at that very bottom picture. Um, once we collect the blood, we put it into a centrifuge, which spins really quickly, and it separates things by weight. So the red blood cells are at the bottom of the um, tube after they've been centrifuged, and then the blood plasma, the liquid part of the blood, is at the top, and then in the middle, you get the white blood cells. It's a very, very small layer, um, and we're collecting the blood plasma, the liquid, and the white blood cells. Yeah, so uh, similar to what we're using uh, those poop samples for, uh, the plasma samples are used to uh, measure hormones in these animals. And so in this case, we're particularly interested in thyroid hormone 
and how um, that uh, modulates their response to environmental change, as well as um, uh, the stress hormones, we mostly use uh, the, the poop samples for that. Mm -hmm. And then that other picture that you can see, what looks like a flattened squirrel on the page. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's basically a data collection sheet. So we can use the same sheet um, for several years in data collection. And I've seen some of the squirrels from 2015, I think was the earliest one that we've caught so far, has, having seen it again the third year in a row. Um, but we can write down all of that information that we just talked about. It all goes on that sheet. Um, the reason why they show a squirrel like that is because if they had, if they were caught with any permanent injuries, if they had been in a fight, for example, um, or maybe escaped a predator, they could note it on here. Um, we haven't seen any of that this year, though. Yeah, so in some years, um, we see a lot more um, bite wounds, and we've even had animals that we've captured that have had uh, broken legs, and then we've subsequently recaptured them the following year, and they've managed to heal from that wound. Um, in, in the case of the, the animal with the broken leg, it, its entire um, joint became fused, um, so it had a limp, but it was able to uh, survive. Um, let's see, as far as okay. the, I think for right now, I'm going to skip the video because I know that we're getting close on time. Um, so let's go ahead and skip that for a moment. Um, and then I just wanted to share a little bit of information with you about life here at Tulick Field Station. So we work really hard. Um, we work, we don't go out early in the morning because it's quite cold and the squirrels aren't out either. So we usually get to the field site around between noon and one, if we're going to Attigan, for example. Um, and then we stay there until five or maybe 5.30, I think we've stayed before, um, setting traps and looking for animals and waiting. Um, and then we work again in the evening sometimes processing the animals. So we've been in here until nine o'clock at night some nights. So it's not your typical nine to five. Um, but I just wanted to show you kind of where we spend our time. So in the very center of this photograph is where we are sitting right now. Um, this is the lab um, that we work in. And uh, at the top left-hand corner, that's my room on the first day before I unpacked everything. Um, so it's quite nice. I have my own room here, and it's a little bit of, you know, quiet at night. Um, next to that picture is the building where we stay. Um, so my room is that second door on the left. And then Corey's room is actually right next door um, on that what looks like the fourth door. The, the middle door is, is not a door, I think. So, um, yeah, right at the top of the yeah. stairs. Um, so, yeah, we're the only people in that building right now because the two people on the sides uh, are employees here, but the employees work schedules like two weeks on, two weeks off. So uh, they are both off right now, but they'll be back. Um, on the far right top picture, that is my favorite outhouse. <laughs> so there are uh, flush toilets here. There's at least three of them but they also try to conserve water because all of that water that um, gets used here has to be taken away and it costs money to take it away to bring to a facility to clean it. So uh, they try to do as much um, composting basically as possible or, or to have um, all of the, they're called the towers. There's a bunch of um, outhouses. This one though is heated, which is very special and I love it. Um, and it somehow it's clean and smells not at all. So <laughs> it's really the best place to be. Um, below that, and again, awkwardly, I put the food below the outhouse, which is usually not the way it begins. Um, but I just, this was to remind me, this is one of the dinners I had. The food here is amazing. Um, they have fantastic cooks and there is never a lack of deliciousness happening. They cook all three meals a day. There's also, you can make sandwiches if we're going into the field. Um, there's ice cream and brownies and cookies that they bake on a regular basis, and my elastic pants still fit, so that is good. Um, but it is going to be a lot of running when I get home. Below that is the sauna, which I've been learning to appreciate. Um, that I can actually see from the lab, which is nice. Um, and they run that a couple times a week, which has been really nice. It's a, a, another way, again, we can only take two showers a week maximum for two minutes each, so you're really quite quick. But you can also go to the sauna and um, steam it out. <laughs> and then there's also um, pitchers of water that you can rinse off with there as well. So actually, that's been my main um, way of staying clean here. On the far left bottom, uh, we have some of the other uh, accommodations here. So they're called weather ports. It's almost like a big tent. Um, 
and they have heaters in them because they're not heated by themselves, but they have little electric heaters. And above that, um, we have a skull. I think that is a, that's a caribou, right? Yeah. Um, a caribou skull. Sometimes um, after an animal has been eaten by predators, you can find their um, bodies in the field. And sometimes um, people bring them back to decorate the area, but also then maybe to take back to Fairbanks with them, which is, I think, where that has gone since I took that picture. Yeah, and there's a, a couple more questions. One is, uh, how far away is the closest town? So it's a between eight and nine hour drive to get down to Fairbanks. Um, but uh, if you go the opposite direction and head north for between three and four hours, you get to Pluto Bay, which is the oil field. So there's not really a town there, um, but there is um, a little medical clinic. And then most of Pluto Bay you can't access um, because it's um, uh, operated by various oil companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's not really a, a town, uh, but there is a, a, a large uh, workforce um, that's further mm -hmm. north. Uh, another question uh, that's squirrel related was, um, do squirrels continue to use the same burrow over years? Uh, and the answer to that is definitely. So around um, Tulik Lake, uh, where the, you had that rocky soil, um, the, the burrows that we have uh, marked um, in uh, the early 90s are the same burrows that we visit um, every year. And so very rarely do you see a burrow close or a new burrow open here. So they seem to be very ancient. Um, and that's likely because there's only a few places where you can uh, burrow around um, Tulip Lake. At Attigan River, where the soil is sandier, you'll see burrows fill in and then new burrows form. And it seems like with that sandy soil, they're, they're more prone to collapse, but it's also much easier to dig new burrows. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question that said, are they more likely to be wounded in high population densities? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not sure on that. I, I actually think what's more important than population density is um, the sex ratio. So when you have a sex ratio that has more males um, relative to females, uh, then I think you get more wounding and more fighting and those kinds of things. Um, typically, the sex ratio is uh, more uh, about twice as many females as males, and that's because the males only live to about three years, whereas the females will live to eight um, years old. Mm -hmm. And then how long does it take for them to become full grown? So uh, Typically, they don't become full grown in their first summer, uh, and they'll continue to grow um, during uh, their second year as well. So um, most, but not all, of the males will become reproductive in their second years. And, and the ones that don't um, seem to grow uh, a little bit more in that, um, that third year, and um, that seems to be associated with the testosterone they produce when they become uh, when they go through that uh, puberty for the first time. All right. Um, and then Maximilian wants to know, let's see, what do we do for entertainment or to pass the time? So where is a lot of working? <laughs> so um, usually during the fun times when other people are watching Star Wars, I'm doing some work. <laughs> that happened last night. Um, so I, yeah, I like during meals, we often sit with, um, it's kind of like a family table scenario. So it, for me, that's really nice. Um, I get to talk to the other um, people who work here and the people who are doing research here. Um, and for me, that's really nice. There's the internet, which is, of course, um, nice as well. We have pretty good internet here. Um, but also in the evenings when we're not doing work, I usually have to go back and I'm writing my journal for you guys as well and, and going through pictures and trying to sort through videos. So um, but we did have we had a March for Science here last weekend. And then we had a bonfire. Um, the sauna is a nice way to relax. So there is, um, there are a lot of different opportunities. There's board games that go on a lot of nights that I miss, but <laughs> but I usually walk by, see them playing, have a brownie and ice cream, and then go back to my room. So, um, and that would be the second dessert of the night, at least. So um, probably eating is a good way <laughs> for me to entertain myself as well. Maybe not a good way, but an enjoyable way. Um, do we want to show them a squirrel? I think. Oh, yeah. Do you want to? Okay, so uh, Corey will go get the squirrel. Um, we did, I, I think I mentioned earlier, we brought back Orange Orange, the one who loves the traps. Um, and he's quite a squeaker. 
So hopefully he's awake and uh, ready to show you guys. Let's see, is there anything about field work that has surprised you? Um, good question, Adina. Yeah, a little bit. Um, there's so much going on in the field, um, so much to remember, so much to keep track of. Also, when we're collecting data, um, there's a lot going on with that as well. This is Orange Orange. <laughs> hey, boy. Oops. Yeah, there you go. So you can see him. This is his trap that he's been staying in. He's a little bit sleepy this morning, I think. Hi. Oh, he's like perfectly. <laughs> Hi, can you see him there? He's so you can get an idea about the size. So if this is my hand, um, you can see, you know, he's just a little bit bigger than that. You can hold them easily in two hands. Oh, that's a really good, yeah. Hi. You're being quiet this morning, aren't you? The other night he was very chatty. I think he was just asleep, so he's kind of wondering what's going on. Yeah, probably. It's still early. It's about 8 o'clock here, so he may be coming out of his burrow for the first time around now. <laughs> good morning. So um, in terms of other ground squirrels that you've probably seen um, if you're in the lower 48, uh, Arctic ground squirrels are uh, bigger, so they're the largest of the ground squirrels. Um, so some of you might know golden mantled ground squirrels. These guys are about twice the size of a, a golden mantled ground squirrel. Uh, and then 13 lion ground squirrels, which are also found in a lot of the U.S., are even smaller than that. So they're, they're Pretty big as far as the ground squirrels go, but of course much smaller than um, marmots. Um, and I think I remember Miss Maxie's class asking about um, why their tails aren't so puffy or so big as the, say, the gray squirrel, the gray tree squirrel. Um, and we were thinking, you know, they actually are quite furry, but it's a more dense, thick fur that would probably keep them warmer than what you would see on the gray squirrel tails, um, who don't live in as cold of climates. So it's really, there is a lot of fur, but it's not puffy. It's more um, dense. Yeah, and they probably don't want fur that's as long as a tree squirrel um, because they're going in and out of burrows, and so they would end up collecting a lot of material in those trails. So it would, tail, yeah. so it would take a lot more grooming. Yeah, hard to keep clean. Exactly. All right. So let's see. I know we're getting just near the hour. Um, do we have any other questions? I couldn't remember what we had from before. I know I feel like Miss Maxie's class asked us more questions, um, but I can't remember. Um, you've done uh, pretty good actually on answering even the uh, earlier questions. So, okay, good. Good. Uh, yeah, you've done great. Um, there's one that just came up. How do they communicate? And somebody wants to know if your your mom wants to know if you're coming home for Christmas. Ha ha ha! And probably bringing a squirrel too. Probably, yes, I will bring a squirrel, no doubt. No, remember, terrible pets. Nobody wants that. Yeah, you do, you do not want these guys for pets. They're not very clean. No. Um, no. In terms of communication, um, they make a variety of um, sort of chirping sounds. Um, and actually, we had a polar trek teacher uh, a couple years ago, uh, Alicia Gillian, uh, that made a, a video that you can find online that, that um, shows a lot of the sounds they make. And so they can use different sounds um, depending on uh, different kinds of predators that are around to, to um, particularly to, to warn their uh, young um, that predators are in the area. And then uh, males will also um, do sort of um, these, they'll stand up on their legs and, and sort of look really big um, and um, chirp at other males in terms of that territorial de defense behavior. Um, let's see, are there burrows out in the open or are they hidden from predators? Um, they are They are underground, so... Yeah, um, so there's um, really no, um, there's no trees obviously, so we're, we're in the Arctic tundra. Some areas um, have a little bit more shrub and sometimes you'll find burrows that are sort of hidden in that um, burrow entrances that are hidden in those shrubs. Uh, but for the most part, um, they're just sort of on the open tundra. Um, but they're a, a great uh, escape route because most animals can't get into the burrows. Mm -hmm. uh, now, bears will actually dig up ground squirrels, uh, but we don't see that that much here. You see it a lot more further south. And the reason for that is um, it's, it's cold here, and the soil um, takes a really long time to thaw. And so it, 
that that active layer that thaws every year doesn't become thawed until August. So there's really a pretty short window where the bears are up to dig into burrows um, that have ground squirrels in them. And then Corey, there was a question, do both males and females build burrows? So I'm guessing yes, but. Yes. Um, so yeah, we've never actually um, measured how much time they spend um, building burrows. Um, I, I think um, there's probably, you know, at, at the periphery of our sites, there's a lot more burrow digging that happens. Um, but again, they're reusing burrows so much, and it's hard to know how much underground tunneling they're doing. And they have two sort of different burrow systems. One they're using during the summer where there'll be burrows everywhere and they'll sort of use everyone's burrow, it seems. Uh, and then there's winter hibernacula, and those are quite different. Um, they tend to have smaller entrances and they're just used um, for that hibernation phase. Great. Um, we want to take a moment here and um, there's some people that are getting ready to uh, sign off. So it's been a very good presentation and we just want um, uh, our viewers to, before you sign off, let us know um, how you liked the uh, presentation. And um, if you have a moment to stand by, I, we can also show your video in a little bit. Um, or actually, you know what would be better, Jen? Um, I don't know if you can get permission from um, the person that took that video, but maybe post that on your journal. Okay, yeah, I think that's better. I mean, it's it's just giving an idea of how we put on collars and um, ear tags. So it's not uh, critical, but yeah, maybe we can post something like that later then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then it also will allow you to kind of explain what's going on in the video as well. Exactly. Um, yeah, so very good presentation. Uh, for people that didn't get their questions answered or if you have more questions, please post them on the journal for Jen and Dr. Williams and they'll respond to them. And uh, this event uh, was recorded, so Judy and I will post it up in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Um, There'll be a link on our website, and then um, people that registered will also get it by email. And uh, yeah, very good, really interesting, and it was fun to hear everything. So good job. Thank you. Um, Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I want to say thank you to uh, Janet and Judy who are doing this, uh, helping us run this presentation. Um, and also, I want to say hi to um, Helena. I see that you are on or listening. Um, and also to my family, so my sister, my cousin, my mom are on, um, my uh, brother-in-law is on. Hi, Tim. <laughs> so I think it's great that you guys could join us here. It's really nice to see you. And my, I mentioned my nieces were here earlier. I don't know if my nephew's been able to listen, but um, if not, maybe we'll have to make him watch it later. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs>